So before, before jumping into details, I'm Amin, and today I'm going to talk about how we are using TensorFlow at the scale in Unity technologies. But I have a couple of questions. So how many people know what Unity is? Okay, I'm surprised. And how many people know what TensorFlow is or have worked with TensorFlow? Okay, pretty good. So I hope this is going to be an interesting talk for you. So, and how many of you know what is a mobile ad network? Good, yeah, the mobile ad network is the annoying thing that pops up in the middle of your game and asks you to click and watch an ad so you can get free stuff. Yeah, I know, but yeah. So, Unity in general is mostly known as a uh, game engine that you can develop your games in 3D using Unity and integrating mobile ad to your game if you're developing a mobile game is pretty easy and it is only toggling a button. But on top of that, uh, Unity has been used and can be used for automotive stuff, creating animations, creating like uh, a structural or, or, or other stuff. And on top of that, uh, Unity has been recently mainly used by yeah. DeepMind and Google Guys for, for uh, simulation purposes, especially using ML engines. But today, what I'm going to talk about is going to be mainly, mainly centered about Unity ads. So in a mobile ad network, like Unity, there are going to be two main players. One is going to be the advertiser and the other one is going to be the publisher. So the advertiser are the guys who want to show ads and the publishers are the guys who want to show your ads. And the whole point is publisher can make some money by showing those ads, but there is a catch in between. The point is that a publisher is only going to be paid and Unity is also going to be paid if and only if the ad has been installed. So that is, up to Unity to pick the right ad for the right, for the right uh, player, so it maximizes the probability or the propensity of the install by that user. And that is the problem that uh, we at Unity are trying to solve. So in my talk, I'm talking about like probability of install, which is going to be the same as probability of convergence or convergence. So if, if you hear any of these words, that means that the probability that the guy installs again. But what are the major data science problems that we are trying to solve here at Unity? The main thing is that from the publisher and Unity perspective, we need to care about what is the probability of installing this ad, given that I show it to this current user. Because it really matters because we are going to be only paid and the publisher is going to be only paid if the game has installed. So basically we need to be pretty accurate in calculating that probability. From the advertiser perspective, they care about what is the expected value of the user if the install happens. So by value, I mean how much money on average the, the user is going to pay in the game. So the advertiser cares about that. And on top of that, if we know what is the expected value of the user, the advertiser might let us to charge them more for good users. Because nowadays, advertisers pay up to like $30 in the United States to get a good user. So in some places, if they believe that, if we can guarantee that this user is a good user, we might be able to charge them up to $45, and they want to pay like $45. And last but not least, we always face the problem of exploration and exploitation. We have an ad, we know that everyone converged on that ad, everyone installed that ad, so it's a great ad. So should we always exploit that ad? Who guarantees that there is not one better ad that we have not shown yet? So we need to explore as well at, at the same time while we are exploiting the good ads. So what is, what, what, what is our system and how it, is, how it is working right now? So we have all our files, all our data in Parquet files, in Parquet formats, stored in uh, Google Cloud Storage. And then we have data proc clusters orchestrated by Airflow that consume those data and generate uh, basically TF records that can be easily and in a pretty fast fashion consumed by our neural network training jobs. And those neural network Training jobs are orchestrated uh, using Kubeflow. So basically, when, when the data is ready, the Kubeflow job fires, and then it trains the network, and then saves that network 
in, again, Google Cloud Storage. But we have some other networks like interest-based targeting and IAP interest-based targeting that are auxiliary models. So basically, they try to represent user in a way that the neural, the neural network understands, and it will be saved somewhere else. So it can be later consumed by production models. And then we have one last final Kubeflow job that combines all those models and put them to production. So based on the, the campaign type that we have and based on the need we have, one of these models will be fired, and then we, we calculate the probability, and everything goes forward. But why do I call it TensorFlow at a scale? Because the scale that we are serving our ads right now is pretty huge. So we each month serve 11 billion ads. And then in each month, we basically reach 1.7 billion users. So 11 billion ads uh, served each month basically translates into thousands of ad requests per second. So 1,000 people send ad requests to us per second. And for each of those users, we need to evaluate thousands of eligible campaigns to be shown to that users. So per second, we are doing millions of ca these probability calculations in order to find the best ad for each user. And for that, if you want to do that with neural network, you don't have any choice but going to TensorFlow. So this, this is going to be the second part of my talk, which is going to be more focused about how we take into account users' interest. And it is going to be more or less uh, centered around basically only TensorFlow and Keras. So what is a user's interest? In our case, a user's interest is being defined by the number of the ad requests ad request sent from different games by that user. So we believe that if you are interested in a game and if you want to get more free stuff so you can increase your life or, I don't know, buy cosmetics and you need gems, so you watch more ads. So if you send more ad requests from one game, it means that you are more interested in that game. Or at least that's the assumption that you are making right now. And the whole user representation by this definition is going to be a mapping from projects, project IDs or game IDs, to ad requests that has been sent from those games. So for example, in this case, user one has played game one and has sent 10 ad requests, and he has played game 14 and has sent 15 ad requests, while user two has played uh, game three and has sent 58 ad requests, and game 58 with five ad requests. But there is a problem here. The way that we are defining the user representation makes us encounter a serious problem. This user representation, by definition, makes the user representation to be pretty sparse. And by sparse, I mean we have thousands of games, but an average user plays only four or five games. So if you want to represent that user using a sparse tensor, using a tensor, it is going to be a huge, long, zero tensor and only a couple of cells will be non-zero elements. And this basically changes everything for us, and I'm gonna address that later in this talk. But the other thing that I'm gonna talk about today is going to be autoencoders. So how many people are, are, are familiar with autoencoders? Pretty good. So autoencoders, well, to, 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 to put it in, in simple forms, like most of the people are familiar with this deep fake stuff, all of them are autoencoders. So autoencoder will try to receive the input and then project at the lower dimension and then reconstruct the, the input. And by, by reducing the distance between this input and the reconstructed input, it will train to learn the network. But how is that useful for us? We will try to learn an autoencoder. So basically we will try to project this sparse user a sparse representation of the user to lower dimension, which is pretty dense and can be used in other networks. And then we will train this network by reconstructing that user representation. So more or less, this, this, the whole idea is like, we are trying to learn a PCA, which is basically principal, principal component analysis. So basically we will try to basically uh, map the user in lower dimensions. Of course, autoencoders more or less, the encoder part is the same. If you remove the nonlinearities, you're going to have a PCA, which basically has found the same thing as the original PCA. But that's the idea. And this is an autoencoder. So those two users that I talked about are going to go through this network. They will project it to one lower dimension in the first layer, to the second lower dimension in the third layer. We will use that as the user embedding 
or as the user representation in lower dimension, which is dense, and then we will use that in our neural network. And then in order to train this network, we will try to reconstruct the user representation use, using the second part of the network, which is basically the decoder part of the network. And there is a, there is a problem here because lots of the times when people are trying to do these form of transfer learnings, if you call it transfer learning, people will basically, for example, in, in word embeddings, people basically save them in, in a huge JSON file and then use that as an embedding later. In our case, it doesn't make sense because we have billions of users, so we cannot create a, a file with billions of lines. So we need basically to, to transfer this whole network, at least the encoder part, to our destination network and do prediction based on that. So basically, during the time that we are training the network, during the time that we are making the inference, we have this tiny network over there that can create the user representation so it can help the other network to do the, the prediction accurately. So the challenge that I have mentioned several times, the data is sparse. But what does it mean? If the data is sparse, it means that it totally changes the way that we store the data. Because we cannot store the data with so many zeros because it is redundant and it does not make any sense. But it also changes the way that we need to train our network because you need to come up with a network that is capable of training on top of a sparse data because if you don't do that, you're going to have problems, and I'm going to show you what that is exactly. But first thing first, let's think about, let's, let's take a look at the data pipeline, or basically the whole training pipeline for deep IVT. The data is stored in uh, Google Cloud Storage. The data proc cluster job basically runs using PySpark. It will stores JSON and TF records of that data, and the JSON will carry some statistics from, from, from the data. And then we will push that through the Keras plus TensorFlow, and then the train model will be shipped using TensorFlow hop module. But how does the input generation pipeline work? Uh, basically, the only thing that we need to represent the data is going to be the game IDs and the ad requests sent from those game IDs. So in our case, we can easily represent the user using two variable length lists like this one that you see in the, in the slide. So user one can be represented using those two lists, user two can be represented using those two lists. But on top of that, so we are gonna basically write them using TensorFlow ecosystem, easy, just a bridge between TensorFlow and Spark, so one liner, that's not a big deal. On top of that, we also write some statistics in JSON, and we will use that later. But one of the more important statistics that we write in those JSON is basically we calculate the quantiles on top of the number of the games played by each user because we are going to use that later to address some anomaly issues. Feature preprocessing. So the feature preprocessing is pretty simple. We just create the feature preprocessing using tf.data.dataset and then we map some of the games played by the user to unknown if they have appeared less than a predefined threshold. Nothing, nothing fancy goes on. So in this example, we have, for example, this is a batch size of three, so three users in this. So it says that user zero has played the first game, user one has played the next five games, and user two has played the last two games. And the ad request counts are of those users. So the ad request count from that game played by user one is going to be 110. The ad request count played by user one, users, uh, user one is going to be the next five, and then the, the ad request count played by those games played by user two is going to be 13 and 33. And the blue one is the pre-processed one. So it is a sparse sensor, so the indices indicate what games have been played by the users. It says that user zero has played that game, so that game has been mapped to 3466, six, and then the values say how many ad requests. So user zero, that game with that number. User one, the next five games with those numbers, and user two, those two last games with those numbers. Good. At the end of the feature preprocessing, you have a sparse sensor. But what should I do? How can I train my network on top of this data? A couple of ideas might come to mind. The simplest one, let's explode this, explode this sparse data to dense and then pass that through the network. Yeah, that might work, but it is not feasible. 
Because if you do that, you are going to carry lots of redundant data through your network. And in order to avoid like out of memory errors on your GPU, you need to, at least we needed to reduce the batch size to less than 1K. And it meant that it took six hours for us to epoch the network for one, to train the network for one epoch. And this network at least requires like 80 to 100 epochs. So this basically is not possible for us. The second option is that, okay, we are using Keras, so let's use the input layer with a flag, and with a flag that uses sparse data, uses sparse equal true, but the sad thing is that Keras is not compatible with TensorFlow sparse tensor. So we needed to think out of the box. We basically needed to send this data through two different inputs, then gather them in a lambda layer in the network and create that sparse tensor that you see over there, and then after that, implement another layer that can basically perform the sparse sense matrix multiplication in a fast way. And if you do that, you're going to end up with something like this. So all the game inputs will be sent through that input layer. And you, from, that, from this point, you need to be super careful about the order of the data. Because if you mess up the order of the data, it means that you're going to mess up the add request count attributed to each user. So we send the games played by, those, by the users in that batch from the game inputs, the add request counts for that user from the other input. Then in the lambda layer, we reconstruct that the TensorFlow sparse sensor, these blue guys. And then we create another Keras custom layer that performs this TensorFlow matrix multiplication for, tens, uh, for sparse and dense matrices in a fast way. Something like this. And what happens if we do that? If we are going to do that, it means that we can increase the batch size from 1K to 20K, and then we can reduce that training time from six hours to 10 minutes for each epoch. And using that, it was feasible for us to push this model to production. But with this presentation, Keras Multi-GPU does not work because Keras Multi-GPU messes up your batch because it puts it to the different GPU. And then if you, if you are not careful, you might divide a user into two batches, which creates problems. So this does not work with Keras Multi-GPU, but I don't care about that because Keras Multi-GPU is not good. So be happy and go forward. There was another, another trick that we used. We said that in order to simplify the problem, Let's just learn the encoder part. And then from those weights that we learn through the encoder part, we transpose those weights and use that in the decoder part. And no gradient will go through the decoder part. So the decoder part is going to be non-trainable, and we only re re reuse the weights that we learned in the, in the encoder part. So with this, we basically divided the number of the trainable parameters into half. And then the network, we, we gave more freedom to the encoder to learn everything. And this worked pretty nice. But there is one final missing part. What should, be your, what should be your basically loss function? In the case of like a binary network, if a user has played, we don't care about the address count. If a user has played a game, one, if not zero. In that case, you might be able to use binary cross entropy. But if you use the binary cross entropy as it is, your network is going to put lots of emphasis on generating non-zero, on generating zero elements. Because by generating only zeros, it is able to reduce the loss, but that is not something meaningful to you. So we needed to come up with a way to put some emphasis on generating non-zero elements. And we came up with something called the mask binary cross entropy, which is basically a normal binary cross entropy, only calculated on top of non-zero elements. And we also calculate the binary cross entropy, the normal binary cross entropy on the whole thing. But we needed to address the anomaly because we noticed that in our data set there are users from Tencent that have played the game like that, that have played 5,000 different games, and that is definitely an anomaly. So that quantiles that I talked about before, we are going to use them to penalize the, the, the users who have played the game. So the more the user deviates from that uh, predefined quantile, the more penalized it will get. Because if you do not penalize these users, your network will try to basically reconstruct, reconstruct those users because it can reduce the loss more by reconstructing those users with 5,000 games compared to a real user with five games or 10 games. So you need to find a way to penalize your anomalies like this. And then we are going to combine everything using a linear relation. 
and now you need to learn one more hyperparameter like alpha, which defines how much, how much emphasis you want to put on learning non-zeros and how much emphasis you want to put on learning zero elements. And there you have it. With these three parts, you can basically create an autoencoder and use the embedding or the code layer as an embedding or as a representation of the user in your destination network. And this was one of the networks that we pushed to production. So as you can see, we have those input layers that I talked about. Then we had the lambda layer, and you can see the output of the lambda layer is basically a sparse tensor. And then we had the IBT, uh, IBT custom sparse layer, which basically projected that 6,000 to 1,024, and then lower dimension, and then 256 was basically the code layer, or basically the user embedding that we used. And then the rest of the network, we try to basically reconstruct the user uh, using the weights learned during the encoder part. And you can see some statistics like the training set like was 50 million users, 14 gigabyte of data, 15, 14 million of the, 50 million of the user for training set, 40 million for the validation set, and 7 million for the test set. And some results. So those red guys that you can see, this is for a user from our training set. Those red guys that you can see, those are the games played by the user. And the blue dots are the reconstruction for that user that the network has tried to reconstruct. You can see for this first game, which is basically the unknown game, as the network has seen so many unknown games from different users, it is able to reconstruct that. But the interesting part is that for those two middle games that is basically a game that user plays, it has been able to reconstruct them pretty well as well. My hunch is that for the fourth game, it has not seen it enough in the network, or I don't know, it has not been able to reconstruct that as well as the previous one. But the more interesting part are these blue guys here, because this basically, because that information will be encompassed in, 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 in the user representation that you sent to your network, and those, are, those blue lines, those are the things that give your network this recommendation power because your network can find out that, okay, if this guy has played this game, maybe one of those blue lines in the middle is more interesting to him as well. And the other one, the other figure is basically just a training validation loss. And then these jumps are basically where the network try to converge by, by manipulating the learning rate itself. So that's why you can see the jump. But there is one more interesting figure. For those four games, I just plotted the output of the network for those four games at the end of each epoch. So the x-axis is the epoch number, and you can see that during the, during the training time, the network has been able to basically reduce the value for that game when it was reconstructing that. So as far as your, as far as your network is learning to create, a, to create a, a, a plot that goes through the right corner of, of the figure, you should be happy. So, some learnings. Of course, the best way to transfer your network to a destination network is always TensorFlow hop module. It is pretty difficult, but it is pretty bulletproof, I would say. If you are able to do that, I always go, I always go through TensorFlow hop module. In the, in the case of transfer learning and freezing your network, because in our case, this, this IBT encoder part that was shipped to the, to the CPI network at the end, it was frozen. So no gradient went through that. So in this case, if you are doing some real distributed training, like being done like Google Cloud ML Engine, that you have the parameter server, this can be a hazard. Because in that distributed training, uh, your network will put all the, all the variables or these weights to the parameter server. And if you are not planning to relearn these guys, in this case, this, the, 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 the first weight for the IBT is pretty huge. So if you are not planning to learn that huge weight, just rebuild the graph, turn that to a constant, so your network is not going to put that to the parameter server. Otherwise, we had, we had experience that it can crash the whole thing because it takes lots of space on the parameter server while it is not learning that. And last but not least, there is always the possibility to do the transfer learning using Keras safe models. It is doable, but it is pretty error prone. But if you are planning to do that, you always need to keep in mind that uh, the losses, for example, when we were training IBT or this autoencoder, we used uh, regularization. You need to remember that 
in Keras world, these regularizers attached to the layers and then will be transferred when you, are, uh, when, you, when you put that in your destination network. And these can create a problem because those regularization in the destination network will be added to your loss. So if you are trying to see if you have been able to get a lift by doing this transfer learning and you are purely comparing the log loss, that regularization can create some problems. So always create your custom callbacks and then uh, calculate the, the, the loss itself without those regularizations. And always start with something that you're confident with and something that you, you, you can make zero to 100. The first thing that we came up with was much more complicated than what I've shown here. But it never flew because it was supposed to be the first version. So always start with something that you are confident with. And that's it. Thank you.